Welcome everybody uh, to the first virtual presentation of the Brown Bag Lecture Series uh, hosted by the Portland Art Museum and the Photography Council. Uh, we've been on a bit of a break, uh, as you all know, for the last handful of months. And so we're excited to be back. Uh, my name is Ray Bittigan, I'm the president of the Photo Council, and we're going to be hosting these talks um, virtually now for a little bit. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, I think we've got the technology worked out, but if anybody has any trouble, you can let us know. Uh, Jay's going to give his talk, and at the end, he'll be answering questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand, and we'll turn on your microphone, and you can ask your question, and uh, Jay will answer it. Um, so I'd like to take a minute and talk about the Photography Council. We're still active, even though the museum is on reduced hours. Uh, I encourage you to keep up your membership and keep supporting us. Uh, we are still working. Uh, we're just a little less visible, but hopefully the brown bag and a few other things will start up soon. Um, today, we're lucky to have uh, Jay Mather with us. He's a semi, he tells me semi-retired, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist uh, who's had a wide ranging career, um, was in Cambodia, worked in newspapers, uh, and now lives in Sisters, Oregon, where the landscape seems to be one of his primary interests, the landscape and the environment. So please welcome um, Jay Mather, and he'll be giving his talk, and then we'll have questions afterwards. Thank you. There you go, Jay. Okay. Hello, and welcome to this uh, unique presentation. Um, it's new for me, so be patient if I... Uh, um, ramble a little bit or get off track or kind of uh, forget to look at the little green dot up on the top of my screen because that's where the camera is. Um, I get to feel kind of like what TV people feel like when they are set to do a newscast and there's no one in the room except them and the, the TV cameraman and maybe the director pointing at them what to do. So um, I have great greater appreciation for uh, speaking remotely. Um, what I want to do today is to show you five separate shows that are um, kind of uh, benchmarks for me in, during my career that began um, when I was in the Peace Corps in 1969. Um, however, the earlier photos from that up until I was working at the Courier Journal in Louisville. I'm not showing any of those right now. There's just not enough time to do everything, uh, nor is there enough time to show you a lot of other projects that I did while I was working at various newspapers, Denver, Louisville, Sacramento. Uh, but I do have these five that are, are symbolic of what I did as a photojournalist and where those particular projects uh, took me um, visually and, uh, and emotionally. I'll start with the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, photographs from Cambodia with a little bit of a backstory that uh, uh, starts like this. You know, you have a certain day in your life when you look back on it, it was a very uh, uh, poignant moment in your life. It was a turning point of sorts. Mine was, uh, the first one I remember was October uh, 28th, 1979, when I was watching a CBS Sunday morning uh, news program. Uh, and in that segment was a uh, piece by Ed Bradley, who was touring the uh, Cambodia-Thailand border uh, with, and showing the refugees that were flowing into uh, Thailand from Cambodia as they were fleeing the Khmer Rouge at the end of the uh, Pol Pot regime in 1979, November 1979. Anyway, um, during that segment, a, a physician shows up in part of the interview, and, I, and I'm taken back because I think I know this guy. I think I photographed him, and uh, sure enough, I did some research and found out that it was my uh, uh, former subject. His name is Dr. Ken Rasmussen. 
And he was uh, on the Thailand border treating the ref refugees as they came in uh, to the country. He and his wife were both there. Um, it took a bit of tracking down to make sure it was the right guy, but uh, uh, the newspaper, uh, and uh, I brought this to the attention of the newspaper and they were all excited about maybe the possibility of us going and doing a story on him and uh, whatever else we could find uh, there when, uh, if we got to go. So we sent him a cable. Well, cable is was the uh, 1979 version of a text or a, an email. And uh, he wrote back a very succinct, a note to us and said, well, the story's here, come on. So that with that, we did. And Joel Brinkley and I uh, left on November 4th, 1979, the same day that the U.S. Embassy in Tehran was captured. Uh, kind of a, another momentous day. Anyway, we spent uh, nearly a month there, uh, did the story on Dr. Rasmussen, uh, visited many of the refugee camps up and down the, the Thailand-Cambodia border, did stories on border trading and uh, uh, other things that were uh, pertinent to the story. At the same time, uh, people in Louisville uh, worked, worked their side of the uh, story and found out that Dr. Rasmussen was also sponsoring a family from a, a refugee family in Louisville. So when we got home, we had a perfect way to tie up the end of the story by doing a short piece on, on them. Uh, the, the story ran, began in December of 1979, ran five days in the Career Journal. Uh, and um, it, was, it was no secret that the newspaper wanted to get it in the paper soon enough so that they could enter it in the Pulitzers the following year in 1980. They did, and we were awarded the, the, the Pulitzer for International Reporting, which was uh, unheard of for a small paper our size. I always considered it as the uh, little blue engine that could. Well, we did. So I'm going to run this first show, and I hope you enjoy it, and save your questions for later.
should have mentioned that uh, Dr. Rasmussen was an emergency room physician in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was sent over to photograph him at, at his one of his last days on the job as he was leaving for the United Nations uh, High Commission for Re Re uh, Re Refugees. And um, ostensibly, I thought he was being sent to Somalia. So it was a bit of a surprise when I saw him on this video uh, with uh, Ed Bradley out of Cambodia. But uh, like I said, it was that it was him, all right. Um, I stayed in touch with Dr. Rasmussen for many years, uh, right up until a year and a half ago, when well, it was almost two years ago now, when he died at the age of 95. I still stay in touch with his daughter too. Um, I, you know, after uh, the the Pulitzer and all, you uh, you kind of continue on and you try to do the best you can. Somebody is unfortunately it looks like there's always somebody watching your back or seeing if you mess up or whatever because the the Pulitzer comes with a great honor but it also comes with a uh, uh, the burden of having to do everything perfectly and uh, of course that's just not possible but that's one of the pitfalls uh, and it's something you have to accept. Um, I stayed in Louisville until uh, 19, the end of uh, 1986 when um, the Gannett Corporation was uh, taking over the ownership of the Courier. Uh, the signs were there for me that I needed to move on. And fortunately, I had a, an opportunity to go to Sacramento, California to the Sacramento Bee. Uh, it was still a, a newspaper that had uh, the willingness to engage people uh, to do uh, big projects, uh, go out of your comfort zone, do things that uh, uh, might surprise the readers. I was uh, given an assignment um, in early 1986 to, or excuse me, um, 88. Uh, it was two years after I got there. In 1988, I was sent to the east side of the Sierras to photograph a bighorn sheep roundup from the herd that was down around Lone Pine, California. Uh, up to the backside of Yosemite National Park. And that was, that was a great, great, great experience, uh, great fun doing that story. And afterwards, I had a hankering to do more in the park. Uh, Yosemite had always been a draw for me. I had been an avid rock climber, mountaineer, um, skiing, backpacking, you know, all that kind of stuff in, in my early years, uh, up until the time that I left Colorado, actually. Um, so the chance to go back to Yosemite and do something uh, was really on my mind. And I wound up talking to one of the biology rangers uh, in the park and he suggested I uh, do something for the centennial of the park that was coming up in 1990. And I thought, well, there you go, that's a good idea. So I, what am I gonna do? I looked around and, um, looked and did a lot of research and found out that uh, photography, the biology, the botany, uh, the pretty pictures, that kind of stuff that had all been done a lot and repeatedly. Uh, what hadn't been done to my findings was anybody uh, documenting the human experience in the park, that human beauty in the park. And that's the story I uh, sold to the, uh, offered to the B and they said, yeah, go for it. Well, nobody knew how long this project was gonna be. It took two and a half years and finally, we did get a get the project done. The B, along with the uh, cooperation of the Yosemite Association, published a book of my work, and the the Sacramento Bee did a special Sunday magazine uh, section about the uh, the project called Yosemite: A, a Range of Life. During that project, and this is the next show was. Um, the um, meeting up with um, two really um, uh, wonderful guys in the park. One was named um, Mike Corbett, who was uh, kind of a, a handyman, do-it-all kind of guy. He delivered the mail for the post office, and and I was I happened to be in the post office photographing the postmaster, a fellow named Rusty Rust, who had been there since probably birth. Uh, and I met Mark, and Mark. I mean, Mike Corbett, and he turned out to be one of the uh, uh, best climbers in Yosemite, had, having done over 50 ascents of El Capitan. And he told me uh, that he 
was uh, going to meet up with a guy named Mark Wellman, who was a paraplegic ranger. Mark Wellman had been injured in a in a in a climbing accident in on uh, in the Sierras in 1992. No, yes, 92, and had broken his back and was paralyzed from the waist down. But they thought they could be the first team to get a paraplegic climber up uh, Yosemite's El Capitan, the 3,000 foot granite monolith. And so uh, within the project of the Yosem big Yosemite project was this other special story. And that's this show. Thirty years ago, July 26, 1989, Mark Wellman, a Yosemite National Park Ranger with his climbing partner Mike Corbett, became the first paraplegic climber to conquer the 3,000-foot granite monolith El Capitan. The plan for the climb was hatched in the mountain room bar during a winter night as they sketched out a harness system for Mark on a drink napkin. They practiced and refined the harness system near the Church Bowl climbing area. Mark trained daily on his hand-powered tricycle in the park employee weight room and at the lodge swimming pool. The climb began July 19th and garnered national attention from television and newspapers. I was with them in the bar at the practice area during Mark's training, the first section of the climb, then at the final summit pitches of the shield route on El Capitan. Mike and Mark also climbed Half Dome in 1991 and a repeat of the El Capitan climb in 1999. Mark continues to advocate for disabled athletes through his speaking and workshop appearances.
a little bit of a funny story at the end of this, uh, the climb, I was a nine mile hike back out to the Crane Flat um, grocery store. And um, so later in the afternoon, almost dinner time, made it back to the, the parking lot outside the uh, store and I'm going in and buying some stuff to eat. And um, the woman behind me says, hey, I recognize you. And I said, how do you, how, how is that? And he said, I saw you up on the rock. And evidently there was a, he says, I know you were saying we're in the same white pants. And I, evidently there were people down in the lot, in, in the parking lot, or in the, what's called the El Cap Meadow, watching the whole climb end um, through big telescopes. But that was kind of a funny, funny little side story. Um, following the, uh, the end of the uh, Yosemite project, there were certainly other things uh, um, going on in the newspaper business in, in Sacramento. And I was doing a lot of daily assignments, but hadn't taken on any really big uh, projects after that. Um, in 1996, my daughter, who was born in 1990, uh, decided she wanted to be a part of the Nutcracker uh, Ballet, uh, which the uh, Sacramento Ballet sponsors every year and, uh, and invites 250 kids to participate in the performances. And of course, that meant I, I should, I wanted to photograph that, of course. And um, the only way I could do it was uh, as in talking to the ballet people uh, was to volunteer and uh, shoot some of the performances. And that way I could get backstage access. Um, that was the a wonderful opening for me into a world that I did not know anything about. And it gave me a great sense of accomplishment and uh, pride that I was able to stay with the ballet for the next 12 years until I left uh, Sacramento. And um, in 2007, in fact, after all the years of working with them, they went on their first international tour to China. Uh, we were gone for two weeks uh, to Shanghai and Beijing, and I got to go with them on this, uh, this trip. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, the ballet gave me a great sense of doing something really different, and I hadn't ever really photographed dance. Um, uh, as, a, as a photographer, you, you, and if you shoot sports once in a while, you know that there's peak action and you try to get those moments when everything kind of comes together. And the same kind of thing applied uh, to dance in, a, in some way. I used to uh, uh, joke with, the, uh, the, one of the dancers uh, told me once that um, you're either moving toward a move or you're moving away from it. And, and, I, and I said, so yeah, it's like the peak action in a soccer match or something. She said, yeah, that's right. I said, so if I uh, miss the picture, that means you got there late. And they, didn't, they thought that was hilarious. But anyway, that was our running joke. Here's the Sacramento Ballet.
I left uh, Sacramento in, uh, I'm trying to get this straight. Well, no, wait, I left, um, let, me, let me back up. I'm, I'm, um, I left Sacramento in 2006. Okay, all right. Um, I, my, my dates were a lot. Anyway, um, went, moved to Sisters, Oregon, which is uh, uh, no, north of uh, north of Sacramento, about 500 miles. We're in the central part of the state. Um, and I moved to a community, a very artful community, a very deep artful community with many different brand, types of artists. There's, you name it, um, a unique place in the world. One of the things that I, I wanted to got involved in when I got here was the Sisters Folk Festival, an organization that's been running a festival, a folk Americana festival for um, almost 25 years. Uh, and I was interested in getting, uh, again, uh, moving into the, uh, continuing on with kind of the performance aspect of what I had been shooting, moving from, from the ballet into um, into music, and I was I had a, a I had a deep interest in American Americana folk music. I had learned the guitar when I was a little kid, and uh, was a very much of a folk uh, music fan, and have been, and always probably will be. And I was able to uh, get on the board of the Sisters Folk Festival in 2008, and spent the next, uh, oh, I don't know, nine or eight or nine years photographing all the performances of the folk festival. And after a while you can, you know, you know photograph every singer and, and performer and you think, you know, what is, what, is, what is something different about what's going on here that I could, could show? And I thought, well, first of all, I'd like to show some of the personalities of the people that are, that are the performers and the artists and get a sense of how they feel about being at this festival and moving on to the next festival and next one and next one and next one. And essentially their, their lives revolve around where they're now they're performing. They're very centered and focused on what they're doing, but they have their minds on where they're going next. And um, so it became a little difficult to make uh, long-term relationships with the, with some of these some of these uh, musicians and, and, and artists, although I have maintained a connection with several. Um, but I found a song uh, that speaks about what I'm talking about, the idea of uh, the, the ephemeral ability, the ephemeralness of, of being a, uh, a folk a musician. I've had my share of good times The taste of love, the kiss of wine I must have played a thousand tunes From town to town in crowded rooms And I've tried to stand up and be strong I've tried to help my friends along And when I'm gone, they'll weep for me But I'll be a fading memory We're here today and then we're gone This life will end just like a song Among the things I've gathered here A little tune, some happy rhyme To recall this fleeting time 
And every once in a while You might think of me and smile You'll hum a tune we used to know Back before I We only have this little time So come and let our voices twine People cheat, they steal and lie They bleed the earth and they foul the sky I've tried to walk the path that winds And leave just these few tombs behind So when you with the ballet dancers and all the musicians in these two shows, I'm reminded of how uh, special these people were. Um, <clears throat> I've never worked with more uh, accommodating, gentle, kind people um, than these people you've just seen. And I think of uh, the great times I've had. Uh, I think you know, one of the great uh, tools that any photographer can have in their bag is serendipity. And that is uh, something you just have to accept that sometimes things are just going to show up and be really great in front of you. And, and you take that as a real, uh, a, a grateful thing that's, that's happened. Um, being here uh, in Sisters is a wonderful place uh, for, for the natural beauty. We're at the edge of the high desert and the eastern side of the Cascades. Um, there's a wild and scenic river nearby called the Metolius. Uh, there's a, another great river on the other side of the mountains called the Mackenzie. Unfortunately, on the other side of the mountains, as you know, this year has been disastrous for uh, the environment and for the people's lives and homes lost. Um, and, I, and I grieve for all that. Um, our folk festival here, in fact, was uh, canceled this year because of COVID. And I think about all the artists and dancers that can't uh, perform because uh, of COVID and um, it's, it's truly sad. Um, 
I do have uh, one show left, and that's the the where I've wound up with my career after all the all the other uh, permutations of what I've done as a photographer, all the places I've been, and the uh, chances I've had to meet many, many thousands of wonderful people. But now I'm focusing on the the quiet side of my um, photography, and that's that's landscape. And I don't know where this saying came from, uh, but I, I use it all the time in my head when I'm out. And that is uh, to understand a place is to know the space between the leaves.
thank you uh, for spending some time with me today. Uh, I guess this is where we will have a few minutes left to take on questions and um, try to answer what I'm hopefully I can do. Uh, Jay, do you see the questions that are in the box or do you need me to read them to you? No, I can see them. Okay. The question, uh, shall I, if I want to answer a question, do I hit the answer live? We could try it. I don't know how what that does. I think it just go ahead and press it and see what happens. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, the question is, how do you and the doctor communicate? Were there translators? Yes, there was. A, there's a picture in one of the uh, uh, clinics when he's, uh, there's a young fellow walking around with him, and that was his translator. The translator also became a, uh, uh, a refugee moved to the United States, had a successful career, still lives in San Diego. <laughs> Rob Kerr has a question. When you look back on the Cambodia project as a continuing photographer, what thoughts come to mind? Um, wow, well, it was a um, exceptional experience. Um, I, I had uh, deep uh, uh, sleep problems when I came back, uh, had nightmares and all because of the, what we had seen. But, um, you know, fortunately the camera is a bit of a shield and was able to, uh, um, you're there to do a job, you know? And so that's what you do. Um, I have great uh, respect for the um, people that worked in Cambodia and tried to um, uh, solve the issues that were going on there. I was wondering how long you were there for that project, uh, Jay? Well, we left on the 4th of November and we got back the day before Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, and uh, I spent uh, the entire Thanksgiving weekend of, just, of November of 79 in the dark room. That's when we had, I had taken all my film with me and carried it everywhere I went. And so I had, a, had all the film to process and contact sheets to make. Nice. Uh, looks like there's some questions in the chat. Do you see those? Um, Allie Young has a question. What is your next, what's next for you in your photography journey? Um, uh, I don't know. Continuing uh, the landscape work, I guess, you know, and um, if something comes along, you are ready for it. Let's see. Um, Sheila, what emotions do you experience when viewing the Cambodia photos? They brought me to tears. I'm informed about history. I was not aware of. Um, I used to get a big lump in my throat when I look at those pictures from Cambodia and I kind of still do. Um, there it's, it's so long ago now that you, you know, I've compartmentalized it and uh, can move on to the rest of my life. Uh, but I never forget the pictures, never forget the experiences, never forget the sounds, the smells, especially the smells. Um, different, you know, the whole thing was just totally, uh, uh, it was, it was a, apocalyptic. Nice. Uh, Jay, Catherine, I see Catherine is asking, are the landscapes taken with film or are they digital? Everything was digital. Okay. And then I have another question from Gardner. Jay, did you climb El Capitan alongside the two climbers to take those photos? Uh, no, uh, there, I would have slowed them down. They, it took seven days for them to do that climb. And I would have been, um, well, in, in other, you know, there was, I had a, I had a choice. I did part of the climb with them. We went up uh, the first, uh, oh, I know, thousand feet to a thing called Mammoth Terrace, and I came back from there, rappelled back to the ground, then um, did other things like photograph the people watching the climbers, the uh, people in the meadows. I mean, that was part of the story, too. And as a journalist, I couldn't just isolate myself on the rock with the climbers. That would have been wonderful, but then you missed everything else that was going on around the climb. At the end of the climb, we hiked into the top of El Cap, spent the night, and then I rappelled off the summit of the of El Cap. We went down another five, six hundred feet on on ropes that I had uh, helped setting up with uh, with another uh, guy named Troy Johnson, who had climbed El Cap several times, and he helped me uh, set the ropes. and We went down and photographed the last. Uh, two or three pitches of Mark and Mike finishing the climb. 
So no, I didn't climb the whole thing. Uh, Eddie Greeley wants to know if you're still in Sisters. Yes, as today, as of today, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a couple more in the questions now. Do you see those? Uh, uh, Tom Strongman, Bill Burnbaum, do you miss film at all? Or are you complete? I, I I don't miss I don't miss the tediousness of film. It, you know, it's a it was a at first it was a really magical process. You develop your film and you had all these little secret formulas that you used to get fine grain and flat negatives that were easy to print and that kind of stuff. But you know, I can do everything and even better, I think, than um, film on a by sitting in a in a well quote light room. <laughs> nice. So yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, you got to evolve. I mean, film was then and digital's now, you know? Okay, there's a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Kate says, is there a story that you wanted and hoped to tell, but didn't get a chance to? Hmm. Yes, there is. One of the program, one of the projects I have always wanted to do um, when I worked in Sacramento was I wanted to do a story on what it was like to be sentenced to life in prison and to spend enough time with some of the lifers there to get a sense of, um, and, and I probably, if I had been there a little bit longer, maybe I could have done that. I had some connections within the prison system that, uh, uh, and there were some new, unique things going on, you know, that uh, hosp there was a hospice uh, uh, facility in one of the prisons. And so there was a lot of, uh, and other prisoners were offering the hospice count, doing the hospice care. So that could have been really, that could have been really interesting. Nice. I, uh, I did not, uh, uh, I did not take up firefighting photography this year. <laughs> uh, and that's a good thing. Do you know Alan Thornton? He's a firefighter, takes pictures along the way. Um, Elaine Korn asks, this is kind of long. I met you shortly after you and Joel had come back. Through all these years, we get to sisters and the landscapes. It appears there was a lot waiting, waiting in the morning for light, waiting in, in the evening for light. Were the best photos happenstance? And did you prefer morning, evening, or night? Um, I'm not a much of a morning person, so there are, but there are a lot of morning pictures, a lot of moon sets, and you know, I always, you know, you can use uh, Photo Ephemeris. It's a wonderful program uh, for landscape photographers to predict when the light and the position of uh, the sun and the moon are gonna be correct so that you have an idea. You're not just uh, going out um, randomly. You know, you actually know when uh, something might be happening. Although the lead picture in that show um, was just blew me away because I didn't expect, I knew where the moon was gonna be, but you never know where the clouds are gonna be or how the light's gonna be, you know? And, you know, it can be a very, can be just a moon in the sky and no clouds around it or anything. It's just kind of dull. But this was probably one of the most exceptional uh, phenomena I ever saw. So nice. yeah, there's a lot of planning to it, but I'm mostly, I, I like sunsets better than sunrises. <laughs> just because I'm too lazy to get out of bed. <laughs> uh, one person's asking if this is recorded so others who are not fortunate enough to join today can view the presentation. And the short answer to that is yes. And it should be posted on our Photography Council uh, YouTube page. And so I think if you were to search uh, YouTube for Photography Council, Portland Art Museum, Brown Bag, you would find uh, that there's a will be an archive of these talks. It may take a week to get it up there, but that's our plan. Uh, and then I think there's one more question on the question and answer thing, uh, Jay from Tom. Strong. Yes, I see that. Um, I have digitized probably 25,000 images or more and have placed them in, um, not just digitized them and sitting in hard drives in my, in my drawer. Um, Everything I ever shot in Louisville has been returned to the University of Louisville Photographic Archives. Um, all this, the California work has been uh, donated to the History Center for Sacramento. Um, the Yosemite stuff went all back to the Yosemite Museum, uh, their archives. Uh, the Folk Festival has uh, uh, all everything I've shot for them. Um, I gave a hard big, 
hard drive back to the Sacramento Ballet of everything that I shot for them. So they have a historical record of 12 years of photography from, from, from that period of time. Um, the only place that hasn't, uh, I don't have a place for any of the, the landscape stuff because uh, there probably isn't a, a, a repository for that. It'll just, uh, it'll just hang out there in the, in the ether world. Well, that looks like all the questions. Oh, maybe there's one more. Is there one more? How are you scanning so many pictures? Um, well, I started in 2007 when I moved here from Sacramento. I bought a Nikon scanner, a cool scanner, and just started going through the images. And uh, not that I was, uh, it was motive, and that was working on it 24 seven, but there were periods of time when I was working quite heavily to get things done. Um, so the whole project really, the archiving everything took me about 11 years off and on. Nice. Well, thank you, Jay, very much. Thank you, Ray, yeah. well, it's, it's been great. Yeah, I mean, it's, it feels a little different talking into the TV, but it's cool. Yeah. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'll be here uh, next month on the third Wednesday of November at noon. Uh, and keep your eye out on your email and you'll find out the details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray.